نحمده و نسلی على رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احل العقدت من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیر من احلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اللہم انی اسألکا علما نافیا رزقا طیبا و عملا متقبلا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سورة الكحف This surah was revealed in Mecca. It has 110 verses, 12 stanzas, and is 18th by the order of revelation. The name of the surah is because in the start of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained and narrated the events of the people of the cave That is Ashabul Kaf, and that is from where it gets its name. The basic background of why the surah was revealed is the questions which were asked from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now what the state of affairs was that there was opposition from the non-believers of Makkah and this was at its height. And uh, one of the methods they used to use to derail Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and attempt to prove against his prophethood was that they used to go to the people of the book and they used to ask questions from their holy books and they used to get hold of some questions so that they would return to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him those questions. And obviously they knew that he did not know how to read and write. So they thought that he will not be able to give the answers. So when the unbelievers, they flooded Prophet Sallallahu all these questions, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala would reply in detail and would at the same time prove the truth of the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu and also used to reassure Muhammad Sallallahu So at the backdrop of this surah, he was asked three major questions. Number one, who were the people of the cave or the Ashabul Kahf? The second was the story of Hazrat Khizr alayhi salam and Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. And the third was that what was the truth about Zul Karnayn? Now, usually when Prophet ﷺ was asked a question, he would wait for the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come and then answer accordingly. But this time uh, he was asked, he replied without anything. He said that I will answer him the next day. And what he forgot to say was, inshallah, this forgetfulness was obviously as a result of human weakness, which even prophets, they were exposed to. So the process of revolution was momentarily halted to provide a teaching moment for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the whole words, the, all the verses of Surah Kahab were revealed and the answers to the questions were given also. And Prophet ﷺ was also taught that whenever in future he has to say something about the future, he needs to say, inshallah. Regarding the excellence of Surah Kahab, there are a lot of traditions from Prophet ﷺ. Hazrat Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala and who reports that Prophet sallallahu said that whoever recites the first three and the last ten verses would be safe from the fitna of the jal. The reason for the safety against the trials of the jal will be because the main theme of Surah Al-Kahf is preparing for hereafter. And uh, we can realize that whoever makes here after his main concern, then Allah will obviously safeguard him against the child. Then Hazrat Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala and who reported that Prophet sallallahu said, if anyone memorizes 10 verses from the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf, he will be protected from the trial of the Jal, that is Antichrist. 
Abu Daoud uh, is um, uh, reports that Prophet Sallallahu has said that if anyone memorizes the closing verses of Surah Al-Kahf from the end of Surah Al-Kahf, then he will be protected from the trial of the judge. Then uh, reciting uh, the Surah Kahf every five Friday has been emphasized by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From Hazrat Abu Sayyid Qudri radiallahu ta'ala who reports that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told all of us that whoever recites Surah Al-Kahf on the night of Juma will have a light that will stretch between him and Kaaba. Then Hazrat Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu has reported that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told that uh, he said that whoever recites Surah Al-Kahf on the day of Juma, there will be a light it will shine from him from beneath his feet to the clouds of the sky and which will shine for him on the day of resurrection and he will be forgiven between the two Fridays. So this is all the excellence of reciting Surah Al-Kahf on Fridays. Now the main subject or the main theme of Surah Al-Kahf is that the Surah basically delivers a very heavy blow to the love of this material world. And thus it empties the heart to the attachments of this world. And the Surah also uh, teaches the reader to how to handle the grief and the worries and the miseries of this world in the best way, because the love of the world is eradicated. There is now room to fill in the heart with the concerns about hereafter. So the basic topic of Surah Al-Kahf is the fear of hereafter. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hadid, that this world is what? Illa mata'ul gharoor. The life of the world is but a matter of illusion. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we recite in Surah Al-Ala, he says, that the actual state of affairs is that although despite the fact that this worldly life is a matter of illusion, the actual state of affairs is that you prefer the life of the world, although hereafter is bitter and it is eternal. Actually, you know what? The cry of the heart and the soul has to be what? Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al akhira. That Allah, there is no joy other than the joy of hereafter. How unimportant this worldly life is, and how important the life hereafter is. It is related in Muslim that Prophet said that the likeness of this world as compared to hereafter is that some one of you took out his finger after dipping it in a river and then saw how much water it had brought out with itself. So this is the comparison of the worldly life with the life hereafter, that the water which is sticking to the finger is the life of this world and the fathoms and fathoms of deep endless water of the rivers and the sea is what the eternal life of hereafter is. As a Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Muslim that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa once he passed by a dead young goat and whose ear had been cut off also and he Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa inquired his companions will any one of you like to buy this dead kid for a dirham and they all refused and none of us would want to do that. And then Prophet added, I swear in the name of Allah that in his sight, this world is as hateful and worthless as this dead kid is in your sight. So this is, this is how important this worldly life is in the sight of Allah. Hazrat Sahal bin Saad radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Musnad Ahmad and Tarimzi that Prophet said, had this world been to Allah equivalent to the value of the wing of a mosquito, he would not have given a sip of water therefrom to the infidels. So world and this worldly life is to Allah even less important and insignificant than the wing of a mosquito. 
Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu said that the world is a prison house of the believer and a paradise of the infidel. Because a believer feels that this worldly life is a prison. Why? Because a prisoner's life is like what? A prisoner, he is not free in whatever he does. He eats and drinks whatever he is given. He sits or stands where he is told to. He has no will of his own. The prisoner does not feel attached to the prison and never considers the prison as his home. He will always be eager to get out of it. And on the contrary, there will be no restrictions placed to the believers or the inmates of the heaven. There will be no restriction. They'll be free to do what they want to and as they will want to. As Allah says in Surah Zuhraf, Fiha ma tashtahil anfusu wa talazzul aryanu wa antum fiha khalidun. So this worldly life should be like a prison for all the believers. Preference has to be to the hereafter. As Hazrat Abi Musa radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Muslim Ahmad the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Whoever loves the world shall damage his hereafter, and whoever loves his hereafter shall damage his world. Thus, when between the world and hereafter we are picking out what choice should we do, we should prefer what is lasting to what is transitory. All the world, all the world, exclusive aim. When a person, he makes the world as the exclusive aim of his life, he will obviously live for the worldly life. All his endeavors will be towards the material aims and interests. And what will happen is that the hereafter will get into the background. And remember, this will lead to loss of hereafter. But in the contrary, when a person goals and aims and targets and makes the destination of Jannah and hereafter as his main goal, then he is bound to suffer some losses in this worldly life also. Hazrat Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, and who has reported that Prophet sallallahu said, the world is accused and what contains is accused except the remembrance of Allah and what he likes and teaches and is taught. Because you know the world, it makes a man forget, forget Allah and forget the hereafter. And then he becomes absorbed in this worldly life continuously and forgets about hereafter. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala who has reported that Prophet Sallallahu said, he asked his companions one day, is there anyone who walks on water and his feet do not get wet? And all the companions answered that our master it cannot be so. And then he answered, explained further that in the same way, the worldly-minded people cannot remain free from sin. Person, remember, who is intent on gaining the worldly players cannot remain free from sins. But if the ultimate aim of the people becomes what? Seeking the countenance of Allah and targeting towards the destination of Jannah then it will not be difficult for him to keep away from sinful acts. Hazrat Qaitada bin Nu'man radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Musnad Ahmad and Tarimsi that Prophet said that when Allah loves anyone, he makes him avoid the world as you make patience avoid water. Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala who relates that Prophet held him. He grasped both his shoulders with his hands and he said, what? Live in this world as if you were a stranger or a traveler. Remember, the traveler does not set his heart to the journey. He does not enjoy the journey. He would not want the journey to continue endlessly. He would long and he would desire to reach his destination safely and quickly. And also the traveler in a journey takes with him what is necessary for the travel and nothing more than that. So this is how important this worldly life is as compared to the hereafter. And for, for the fear of hereafter, we need to fear Allah and we need to fear the torments of hellfire and the torments of the day of judgment and the torments of the grave. 
and the accountability on the day of judgment. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu said, <coughs> by him who has my life in his hand, if you knew what, what is known to me about the anger of the Lord and the terrible events of the last day and hereafter, you would laugh less and you would weep more. We, we learn from Quran and Hadith that people of hellfire, they will cry. They will cry that there will be marks and there will be lines on their cheeks because of the tears rolling down their faces. Prophet Sallallahu has been reported by Hazrat Abdullah Ibn Umar that he said, he was asked that, O oh Messenger of Allah, tell us, who is the wisest and the most far-sighted of men? And Prophet Sallallahu replied, he who remembers death much and makes the greatest preparation for, it, for, for after death. They alone are wise and prudent who are like that. They will earn the respect in this world as well as the glory in hereafter. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Hazrat Shaddad bin Aus, Allahu ta'ala, who reports that Prophet Sallallahu said that the wise and the strong is the one who keeps inordinate appetites under control and strives for the life hereafter. And the foolish and the weak is he who subordinates himself to his desires and does what and hopes to his desires and he hopes in return the best from Allah. Prophet Sallallahu has been reported by Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he said that a person whose chief aim and ambition will be seeking hereafter through his efforts and his exertion, Allah will grant him contentment, that is tranquility and freedom for his want. Allah will grant him contentment to his heart and remove his distresses and the world will come to him humbled by itself. But a person whose chief aim and ambition will be seeking of this world through his efforts and exertion, Allah will provide the marks of want in the middle of his forehead and on his face and make his condition miserable. And he will get only that much of the world as had been ordained for him beforehand. So remember, remember my sisters and my daughters, this life is short. Hereafter is eternal. This world is temporary. Hereafter is permanent. This is inferior and that is superior. And in, in hereafter, in the day of judgment, death will be brought in the form of a white ram and it will be slaughtered and it will be announced for all the inmates of hellfire and all the inmates of Jannah. It will be announced that now you will you will keep on being young and you will never get old. You will always be healthy and you will never get sick. You will always stay here and you will never be asked to leave and you will always live and death will not attend you. The rewards are eternal. The punishments are eternal. The bounties of this world, they are nothing as comparable to the bounties of Jannah. Jannah, which no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has felt. We can never, never even in our wildest of dreams comprehend what the Jannah will be like. The houses of this world as compared to the houses of Jannah. One, one brick of gold and the other brick of silver. And then there will be pearls studded with pearls and rubies and emeralds. The worries and the tensions of this world are nothing, nothing as compared to the worries and the miseries and the tensions, and the torments of hellfire. We learn from a detailed tradition of Prophet ﷺ, which I will be explaining in my own words, that a person, a person who was blessed, who was blessed and one of the most blessed persons in this world, you name it and he had it, all the bounties of Allah, and hardly any trials and hardly any hardships and touched him in this world. When on the day of judgment, he will be made to dip just one dip in one pool of the hell fire. 
and he will be asked, how are you? He will say, me? Blessings never touched me. I was never blessed with bounties of Allah. With just one dip in one pool of hellfire will make him forget all the blessings he was blessed in this worldly life. And then there will be a person who would be like one of the most deprived persons of this world. No minimal bounties and minimal blessings of Allah. And he suffered with all the trials and had a miserable life when he will be just given just a one dip in one pool of Jannah and he will be asked, how are you? He will say, I? No hardships and no trials ever touched me. So this is the comparison of this worldly life as compared to the life hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us establish the right priorities and right preferences in this life. Remember, I will now hear, I will want to sum up the basic uh, message of and the basic summary of um, Surah Al-Kahf. As I have already mentioned that um, the surah delivers a heavy blow. The surah delivers a very heavy blow on the love of this world. And it removes all the love and the lust and the desire of this world from our hearts. And fills it up with the love of Allah and the love of Prophet Sallallahu the desires of Jannah and the fear of hereafter. Now, doing this, the surah teaches us, motivates us, encourages us to spend the worldly possessions for hereafter. Why? Out of desire to trade for Jannah. And then it also gives us a comparison of the worries and the hardship of this world as compared to the torments of hereafter. Thus, training all of us to ignore the trials and the hardships of this worldly life and to stay patient, content, and grateful in the decisions of Allah. And rather than worrying about the hardships and the trials of this world, to start worrying and fearing and striving to save ourselves from the eternal punishments and the intense torments of hereafter. So the surah trains us to make the fear of hereafter as a primary preference and the desire of reaching Jannah as the predominant desire. Now, keeping all this in background, let's start the commentary of the surah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, illazi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba wa lam yaj'allahu ayvaja. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all praise is due to Allah, who has sent down upon his servants the book and has not made therein any deviance. So Surah starts with praising and exalting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has made it straight to warn of severe punishments from him and to give good tidings to the believers who do righteous deeds that they will have a good reward in which they will remain forever and to warn those who say Allah has taken a son they have no knowledge of it nor have their fathers grave is the word that comes out of their mouths they speak not except a lie Verse number six, then perhaps you would kill yourself through grief over them if they do not believe in this message and out of sorrow. This verse number six conveys to us the criteria what one's concerns should be. Prophet Wasallam, his cause of worry and anxiety in this life came when when his people continued to disbelieve in the sincere messages of Prophet Sallallahu Their mockery and rebellion, they, they did not, just, they would not believe. They would go on rebelling. This did not deter Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for keep on motivating them 
and keep on working to spread the teachings of Islam with full earnestness, this is the important message. And it is a moment for us to reflect on what worries and concerns we are holding heavy in our lives. What do we worry about? What do we grieve about? What, what are our anxieties about? We just need to think about it and compare what Prophet Sallallahu would grieve about. Indeed, we have made that which is on the earth adornment for it, and we may test them as to which of them is best indeed. And indeed, we will make that which is upon it into a barren ground. Or have you thought that the companions of the cave and the inscriptions were among our signs a wonder? Mention when the youth retreated to the cave and said, Our Lord, grant us from yourself mercy and prepare from us from our affair right guidance. So we cast a cover of sleep over their ears within the cave for a number of years. And then we awakened them that we might show which of the two factions was most precise in calculating what extent they had remained in time. So from here, in the next verses also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the narration about the people of the cave. Who were they? What happened? The people of the cave, they were a group of young men. And they lived in the time, uh, they lived in the Romans in the time of the emperor Decius. And the time period was 249 to 251 AD. Decius was the king of the Romans. He was a tyrant. He worshipped idols. And he commanded his people to do so as well. Now, whoever disobeyed him was either tortured or was finally killed. Now, these group of men, they secretly started practicing the religion of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam where in a society where everyone else was worshipping the false idols. Now, these men, they were not related to one another, and they came from different parts of the city. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them together under the common belief that Allah is one. Now, they had accepted Tawheed with such a firmness that for this, they left their whole lives and all their possessions behind. Now, they truly embodied the Islamic criteria of concerns, which is what? Choosing to succeed in the trials of hereafter over this material world. They choose to love Allah and follow his commandments over everything else, despite knowing that they could be tortured or even killed. So an important thing to note here is that these men, they were young adults and they were worshipping Allah from a young age. And this act is a very, very beloved act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and Prophet sallallahu has also said that out of the seven people who will be allowed to enter the shade of Allah's throne on the day of resurrection, when there will be no shade or no protection other than that, Two of those will be whom? Number one, a person who in youth grew up in the worship of Allah. And the other, a person, a young person or a man who was called by a woman of beauty and position. But he replied that I fear Allah. So worshiping Allah, obeying Allah in youth is something which is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did what and how did Allah help them? Now we will be reading and uh, reciting the verses and we will be going through the story of these people of the cave. Verse number 13, it is we who relate to you their story in truth. Indeed, they were youth who believed in their Lord and we increased them in guidance and we made firm their hearts when they stood up and said, our Lord is the Lord of heavens and earth. Never will we invoke beside him any deity. We would have certainly spoken then an excessive transgression. 
these people have taken besides him deities why do, do why do they not bring for worship of them a clear authority and who is more unjust unjust than one who invents allah about allah a lie the youth said to one another and when you have withdrawn from them and that which they worship other than allah retreat to the cave your lord would spell out your lord would spread out for you out of his mercy and will prepare for you from his affair facility this is what this is this is reliance and reliance comes out of what comes out of patience remember patience steadfastness in obedience and reliance Allah loves all these and when somebody is reliance obedient and patience then Allah helps supports guides protects and provides for that person how did Allah do all this verse number 17 and had you been present you would have seen the sun when it rose inclining away from their cave on the right and when it set passing away from them on the left while they were lying why within an open space thereof that was from the signs of allah he who whom allah guides is the rightly guided but he whom he leaves astray never will you find for him a protecting guide so what happened was these men they left their positions behind and they immigrated for the sake of allah so allah made the best arrangements for them in an expansive cave where the sun did not disturb them in this deep sleep also this was the help the protection and the support from allah hazrat abu huraira radiyallahu ta'ala and who has reported that prophet sallallahu <coughs> prophet sallallahu said that there are three people whom Allah, whom Allah takes the charge that he will surely help them. Number one is a warrior, is a mujahid in the cause of Allah. Number two, a slave who wants to free himself by a payable contract. And number three, whoever seeks chastity by marriage. So these men were what? they were the immigrants they were the mujahideen in the way of allah so allah took it upon himself to aid them verse number 18 and you would think them awake while they were asleep and we turned them to the right and to the left while their dog stretched his four legs at the entrance if you had looked at them you would have turned from them in flight and ha and and been filled by them with terror what was this? Allah mentioned that he allowed the men to toss and turn about so that they would not, what? They would not develop bed sores. This is how Allah, the most merciful, takes care of his servant down to the very last detail. And then their movements, that is, their turning in the sleep, along with their dogs stationed at the entrance, was also to reassure all the passerby bandits that they were not dead but they were living men who would retaliate against any attack. This is how Allah protected the few belongings they had brought with themselves also. So Allah protected them. Allah protected their flesh. Allah protected their body. Allah protected their belongings. This is how Allah takes charge of all those who stay patient, who stay obedient, and who rely on Allah verse number 19 and similarly we wakened them that they might question one another said a speaker from among them how long have you remained here they said we have remained a day or a part of a day they said your lord is most knowing of how long you remained so send one of you with his silver coins of yours to the city and let him look to which is the best food and bring you provisions from it and let him be cautious and let no one be aware of you now the miraculous aspect about the story of the people of the cave is that when they were forcibly exiled into the cave because of the opposition from the king and from the people of the town when all the opposition it became unbearable 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them in deep sleep for 300 years. Now this verse narrates that when they woke up, they had no idea how much time had passed by. They might, they might have been still thinking that they were living in their own time. Now their topic of discussion was like no useless debate. Their minds were set on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through all their actions. So their primary concern was they told them that they need to get what? Pure, clean food, because they knew that nourishing the body with pure food was a way of nourishing their level of faith and iman also. And what did they do? They uh, ventured, they ventured outside the cave and they were immediately recognized by the people of the town because as missing young, young men, because of their different attire, a different language, and moreover, the currency which they carried was also belonging to which period? The time of Decius. And the shopkeepers of the city recognized the currency also. And these men had also been labeled as the culprits and the terrorists of their time. And because of this, the, there had been uh, their pictures and their statues had been made and they had been passed down in history as well. So that is why they were recognized. Now, the people of the town, they took the men to the new ruler who now was a Muslim. He heard their story and uh, he guaranteed that they would be safe in the land. Now, the story of the people in the cave it was meant to be a miraculous lesson from Allah about his power, about his control over the resurrection of the dead back to life. However, what the people of the city, they ignored all these realities and they resorted to shirk, to polytheism by erecting monuments over the grave of these people and uh, turning to the graves into people of worship, into the places of worship. And how did they behave? Now you will uh, read. Uh, they said that indeed, they, if they come to you, they will stone you or return you to their religion. So this was basically their preference and their worries. And never would you succeed hereafter. And similarly, we caused them to be found that they who found them would know that the promise of Allah is true and that of the hour there is no doubt. So you see, the whole miracle was shown to the people of the city who now had obviously uh, turned into Muslims to have and develop a stronger faith on hereafter. That was when they disputed among themselves about their affairs. And then they said, construct over them a structure. Their Lord is most knowing about them said those who prevailed in the matters, we will surely take for ourselves over them a mosque or a masjid. They will say, so this is what? This is all their behavior that they constructed monuments to start worshiping other than Allah. What is the concept of graves and visiting graves in Islam? Prophet Sallallahu has said, Allah has cursed those women who visit tombs and those people who build mosques over the tombs and they light lamps on the tombs. Similarly, Prophet Sallallahu said, be aware that people who have passed before you made tombs of their prophets, the places of worship. I forbid you to do that. It has been reported in Muslim. Similarly, in Bukhari and Muslim, it has been reported that Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah has cursed the Jews and the Christians, for they made the tombs of their prophets as places of worship. So the behavior of these people was strange. If a righteous, Prophet said that the behavior of these people was strange. If a righteous person from among them, they died, they would build a mosque over their grave and draw pictures. They will be treated as the worst criminals on the day of resurrection. They will say 
they were three, the fourth of them being their dog, and they will say they were five, and the sixth of them being their dog, guessing at the unseen, and they will say they were seven, and the eighth of them was their dog, say, my Lord is most knowing of their number, none knows them except a few, so do not argue about them except with an obvious argument, and do not inquire about them among the spectaculars from anyone. And never say of anything, indeed, I will do that tomorrow. So this was what? This was uh, what Prophet Sallallahu was corrected. And uh, the debate was, uh, there was, uh, he was told that in, uh, in future, whenever he says something about future, he needs to say what? He needs to say, inshallah. Except when adding the fit Allah wills. And remember your Lord when you forget it and say, perhaps my Lord will guide me to what is nearer than to uh, than this to the right conduct and they remained in the cave for 300 years exceeded by nine <coughs> there uh, are people who think that they slept in the cave for 309 lunar years or uh, they might be 300 solar years and uh, they remained in the cave for Quran says for 309 years, say Allah is most knowing of how long they remained. He has knowledge of the unseen aspects of heavens and earth, how seeing he is and how hearing they have not besides him any protector and he shares not his legislation with anyone. So actually the debate of how long they stayed and how many they were in number, this is not important. Actually, what we need to focus is not on the years they slept on or to investigate how many they were in number. What we need to focus on was what they did and how they behaved and how they loved Allah and how they put uh, how they uh, made the fear of hereafter as the most predominant fear in their life. <coughs> and recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is no change, no changer of his words, and never will you find other than him a refuge. And keep yourself patient by being with those who call upon their Lord in morning and evening, seeking his countenance, and let not your eyes pass beyond them, desiring adornments of the worldly life, and do not obey uh, and do not obey one whose heart we've made heedless of our remembrance and who follows his desires and whose affairs is ever in neglect. Verse number 29, and say, the truth is from your Lord. So whoever wills, let him believe and whoever wills, wills let him disbelieve. Indeed, we have prepared for the wrongdoers a fire whose walls will surround them. And if they call for relief, they will be relieved with water like murky oil, will, will scald their faces. Wretched is the drink and evil is the resting place. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu like. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here saying that the inmates of hellfire, they will be given what? Bima in kal muhal. Muhal is what? It means like a burning molten lava or a murky residual oil. It will be presented to them as a beverage. And this will do what? Yashwil wajur. It will, it will burn, it will scald their faces. Biksa sharab. This is the most wretched drink which will be presented. And what will be the resting place? Saat mustaqarrun wa maqama. Rabba nasrif anna azaba jahannam. Inna azabaha kana gharama. Inna ha saat mustaqarrun wa maqama. Verse number 13, indeed, those who have disbelieved and those who have believed and done righteous deeds, indeed, we will not allow to be lost the reward of any who did well in deeds. Those will have gardens of perpetual residence beneath them rivers with flow. They will be adorned therein with bracelets of gold and will wear green garments of fine silk and brocade, reclining therein with adorned couches 
excellent is the reward and good is the resting place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a manner while discussing in Quran that wherever hell is explained, he will always pair it with the description of heaven. And why is it this so? Because Quran is, inspires emotions that is in balance between hope and fear. Verse number 32, and present to them an example of two men. We granted to one of them two gardens of grape wines, and we bordered them with palm trees and placed between them fields of crops. Now, from here is the parable of two men, where one is blessed with fertile land and the other one isn't, showing that this world is basically what? Remember, this world is a place of trial. And Allah, no doubt, will be the most just and most fair on the day of judgment. But here in this worldly life, he puts people to trial, blessing them some, blessing some people and depriving some people. And all of these are trials of this worldly life. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses a person, he, wa he just wants to see the person do what? He just wants to observe and see how the person behaves. The person he expects to be grateful, to be grateful, to exhibit all forms of gratitude and to spend the blessings within the limits which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us to spend within the limits of the spending set by Allah and to earn all these blessings destined for him by the halal and by the lawful and the righteous manners and to refrain from arrogance. And then last but not the least, to spend all these blessings in the path of Allah as an investment, as an investment for the hereafter. And also to seek forgiveness for the blessings of Allah was sent in his way. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects the person when he is blessing the person. When Allah does not bless a person, he watches whether the person will, number one, will person will stay and remember Allah, be grateful to the rest of the bounties of Allah, will he display patience, and will he seek permissible ways to relieve the problem and uh, seek to the halal and the permissible ways of earning and of gathering those blessings of Allah? And will he continuously stay his, uh, keep his trust in Allah and to stay away from all forms of envious and jealous behaviors while he is being deprived of certain bounties of Allah? So these are the trials from Allah. And while we will be reading the whole events, we will see that both these neighbors were put into trial. One of them was blessed with both the gardens and the other was deprived. And how did they behave and who succeeded and who failed? We will be now gathering from these verses. Each of the two gardens produced its fruits and did not fall short thereof in anything and we caused to gush forth within them a river and he had fruit. So he said to his companion while he was conversing with him, I am greater than you in wealth and mightier in number of men. So where was this? Allah wanted that he should not be arrogant but he failed because he was arrogant and he entered in his garden while he was unjust to himself and he said I do not think that this will perish ever and I do not think that the hour will occur and even if I should be brought back to my Lord I will surely find better than this as a return. Now the man who had been blessed with the two gardens he grew arrogant and his luxury made him forget Allah and the day he would be held accountable for all these blessings. A common misunderstanding, remember, to all those who, blessed, who are blessed with wealth is that they believe that Allah is happy with them. There are many people who are blessed and they start assuming and imagining and believing that Allah is happy with them. That is why he is showering his blessings. 
And they also start believing that Allah will continue sending down favors their way. And many also start believing that they will, they will even barter their wealth for this world in exchange for heaven and next life. So this man's pride distracted him from thanking Allah and attempting to please Allah. And this became the ultimate cause of failing in his test of life. Now, how did the next person behave? Verse 37, his companion said to him, this was the person who had been tried by depriving him. His companion said to him while he was conversing with him, have you disbelieved in Allah who has created you from dust and then from a sperm drop and then proportioned you as a man? That is, he was guiding him continuously towards gratitude and remembrance of Allah. And as for me, he is Allah, my Lord, and I do not associate with my Lord, anyone. He stayed what? Despite being deprived, he was what? He was obedient and he was grateful to Allah. And why did you, why did you, when you entered your garden, not say what Allah has willed has occurred? There is no power except Allah, although you see me less than you in wealth and children, but it may be that my Lord will give me something better than your garden and will send upon it a calamity from the sky and it will be becoming a smooth, dusty ground. So he was patient, he was reliant, he was continually remembering Allah and he was also teaching his friend to remember Allah and to be grateful or its water will be sunken into the earth so you will never be able to seek it and his fruits were encompassed by ruin. So he began to turn his hands about in dismay over what he had spent on it, all the time, all the energy, all the wealth he had been spending on it while it had collapsed upon its trellises and said, oh, I wish I had not associated with my Lord anyone. And there was from him no company to aid him other than Allah, nor could he, nor could he defend himself there the authority is completely for Allah the truth he is best in reward and the best in outcome so he uh, the person other man he was uh, he was very hardly blessed and he dictated his time in remembering Allah, in worshiping Allah and motivating his neighbor to do so well and so he succeeded and the other neighbor, he was a failure. The believing man what did not curse, did not curse out of jealousy, saying that this was, he was just trying to tell him that this was a manner of Allah that he might get deprived also. So the end of the parable shows that the two men were given two different tests in life and the one who had succeeded was the one who took out time to worship Allah and did not keep his act to himself also and spread it to all those around him so that the others may benefit also and the person he displayed immense patience and gratitude and reliance he did not grow jealous and uh, he was an obedient servant of Allah and he succeeded and his neighbor what? He failed. And present to them the examples of the life of this world. It's being like a rain which we send down from the sky and the vegetations of the earth mingles with it. And then it becomes dry remnants scattered by the wind. And Allah is ever over all things, perfect in ability, wealth and children are but adornments of the worldly life. Al-mal wal banuna zinatul hayati dunya, and what is remaining but the enduring good deeds are better to your Lord for reward and better for the one's hope. And born of the day when we will remove the mountains and you will see the earth prominent and we will gather them and not leave behind from them anyone. And they will be presented before your Lord in rows and he will say, you have certainly come to us just as we created you for the first time. But you will claim that we 
but you claim that we would never make for you an appointment and the record of the deeds will be placed upon and you will see the criminals fearful of that within it and they will say oh woe to us what is this book that leaves nothing small or great except that it has enumerated it and they will find what they did present before them and your law does not injustice to anyone and mention when we said to the angels prostrate to adam and they prostrated except for iblis he was of the jinn and departed from the command of his lord then will you take him as his descendants as allies other than me while they are enemies to you wretched it is for the wrongdoers as an exchange I did not make them witnesses to the creation of heaven and the earth or to the creation of themselves. And I would not have taken or misguided his assistance and warn of the day when he will say, call my partners whom you claimed and they will invoke them, but they will not respond to them. And we will put between them a valley of destruction and the criminals will see the fire and will be certain that they are to fall therein and they will not fall, they will not find from it a way of elsewhere. And we have certainly diversified in this Quran for the people for every kind of example, but man has ever been most of anything prone to dispute and nothing has prevented the people from believing when guidance came to them and for and from asking forgiveness of their lord except that there must befall them the accustomed precedent of the formal people or that the punishment should come directly before them and we sent not the messengers except as bringers of good tidings and warners and those who disbelieve dispute by using falsehood to attempt to invalidate thereby and the truth have taken my verses and that of which they are warned and ridicule and who is more unjust than one who is reminded of the verses of his Lord, but turns away from them and forgets what his hands have put forth? Indeed, we have placed over their hearts coverings, lest they understand it and their ears deafness. And if you invite them to guidance, they will never be guided than ever. And your Lord is forgiving, full of mercy. And if he were to impose blame upon, upon them for what they earned, he would have hastened for them the punishment. Rather, for them is an appointment for which they will never find an escape. And those cities, we destroyed them when they wronged and we made for their destructions an appointed time. And mentioned when Musa salam sent to his servant, I will not cease traveling until I reach the junction of two cities or continue for a long period. Now, from here starts the events which have been narrated regarding Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Hazrat Fizr alayhi salam. How did all start? Hazrat Musa alayhi salam was sitting with his companions when one of them asked that who was the most knowledgeable person on the earth. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam immediately replied, I am. Now, this answer displayed what? A mild form of a pride, whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not favor pride or arrogance. And so he corrected Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. Hazrat angel Jibrail alayhi salam was sent down and he informed Hazrat Musa alayhi salam of a person named Hazrat Khizr. And uh, he was told that he was the person who was most knowledgeable person of the time. And Hazrat uh, Jibrail alayhi salam instructed Hazrat Musa alayhi salam that Allah commands you to go and seek knowledge from Hazrat Khizr alayhi salam. And to this Hazrat Musa alayhi salam immediately complied and he started a journey along with his uh, companion who was also his servant, uh, which uh, has been reported to be Hazrat Yusra bin Noon in most of the cases. 
Now, so this story of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Hazrat Khizr alayhi salam will provide us many lessons and the story will teach us, number one, the etiquettes of acquiring knowledge, the importance of seeking knowledge, avoiding arrogance, becoming a good student. What are the qualities? What is the behavior? How should be the mannerism of a good obedient servant, the rights of a teacher? And then we'll also at the same time, we'll also teach us and educate us how successfully we can pass the trials of this life to please Allah. And uh, the journey took, uh, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam also took his companion, his servant as a companion. And we will learn from here that taking your servants and your colleagues and your assistants as companions in the path of knowledge is also a sunnah of the prophets uh, and Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And this journey of acquiring knowledge also uh, showed that how determined Musa alayhi salam was and what, with what willpower he was adamant to seek knowledge. Attaining knowledge is not only a matter of few weeks or months, but a lifetime journey. And prophets, including Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and all the prophets, they exhibited this behavior in this manner in their life. But when they reached the junction between them, they forgot their fish and took its course. And the fish, it took its course into the sea, slipping away. So when they had passed beyond it, Musa salam asked to his servant or attendant, bring us our morning meal. We have certainly suffered in this journey much fatigue. So this verse number 62 shows what? That shaitan made them forget the place where they were made to stop. And shaitan is ever present and ever ready to raise hurdles for all who seek knowledge and ask for protection against shaitan when we are trying to seek knowledge. And uh, another thing we learn from here is what? That fatigue and exhaustion is bound to uh, come while we are seeking knowledge. And the attendant said, what? Did you see when we retired on the rock? Indeed, I forgot there the fish and none made me forget it except shaitan that I should mention it. And it took, and it took its course into the sea amazingly. Musa alayhi salam said, that is what we were seeking for. So they returned following their footsteps and they found our servant from among our servants. Who was this? Hazrat Khizr alayhi salam, to whom we had given, uh, who had, uh, whom we had given mercy from us and had taught him from us a certain knowledge. Musa alayhi salam said to him, may I follow you on the condition that you teach me from what you have been taught of the sound judgment? Verse number 67, he said, indeed with me, you will never be able to have patience. So what do we need while seeking education? Patience and to stay patience is very important as a student. And how can you have patience for what you cannot encompass in knowledge? Verse 69, Musa alayhi salam said, you will find me if Allah wills patient and I will not disobey you in any order. So a good student is who is patient and who is obedient to the teacher. He said, then if you follow me, do not ask me about anything until I make to you about it mention. Questioning while seeking education is important, but the questions have to be uh, very respectful. The questions have to be uh, to the point, not out of reference, not irrelevant, not disrespectful. Remember all questions which are made with the intention to make fun of the teacher or to make a pointless debate are disliked by all questions which are uh, made with the intention of either increasing or correcting the knowledge or improving our deeds, they are allowed, they are permissible, and in fact, should be made. So uh, he uh, has a Khizr alayhi salam, he asked that pointless questions should not be asked. So they set out until when they had embarked on the ship, Hazrat Khizr alayhi salam 
tore it open. As Musa alayhi salam said, have you torn it open to drown its people? You have certainly done a grave thing. Hazrat Khizr alayhi salam said, did I not say that with me, with, me, with me, you would never be able to have patience. So means what? That a teacher can be at times, the teacher can scold, the teacher can be hard or tough on the students for obedience and for discipline. Verse 73, Musa alayhi salam said, do not blame me for what I forgot and do not cover me in my matters with difficulty. So asking for forgiveness and staying obedient and patience. So they set out until when they met a boy, Hazrat Khizr killed him. Musa alayhi salam said, have you killed a pure soul for other than having killed a soul? Have you certainly done a deplorable thing? Hazrat Khizr said, did I not tell you that with me, you, you would never be able to have patience, 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 patience is needed for what? For a good student, for obedient student. Musa alayhi salam said, if I should ask you about anything after this, then do not keep me as a companion. You have obtained from me an excuse. So an obedient student needs to give an excuse for his disobedience and for lack of patience. So they set out until when they came to the people of a town, they asked its people for food, but they were what? They were not hospitable and they refused to offer them hospitality and they found they're in a wall about to collapse. So Hazrat Khizr restored it. Musa alayhi salam said, if you wished, you could have taken for it a payment. Hazrat Khizr said, this is parting between you and me. I will inform you of the interpretation about which you could not have patience. As for the ship, it belonged to the poor people working at sea. So I intended to cause defect in it as there was after them a king who seized every good ship by force. And as for the boy, his parents were believers and righteous, and we feared that he would overburden them by transgression and disbelief. So we intended that their Lord should substitute for them one better than him in purity and nearness to mercy. And as for the wall, it belonged to two orphan boys in the city, and there was beneath it a trier for them, and their father had been righteous. So your Lord intended that they reach maturity and extract their treasures as a mercy from their Lord. And I did it not out of my own accord. That is the interpretation of that about which you could not have patience. So from here, what do we learn? That the major uh, student-teacher relationship, we get to learn about the student-teacher relationship. It also teaches us how to handle difficulties and trials of life with the virtues of patience, respect, obedience, and humility. The major lesson we learned from the story was that the things are not always how they may seem to appear. When Hazrat Khizr alayhi salam, he punctured the boat, it seemed, apparently it seemed that he had ruined the livelihood of the master. But in reality, he had saved them from a much bigger problem. That is their boat being snatched. Killing a child seemed like a severe act and obviously was a big crisis for the parents. But Actually, it was a means for what? For a better ending. So this teaches us what? That whenever we are afflicted with pain, with grief, with loss, or from any crisis from Allah, we need to remember that this is by the command of Allah. He is Al-Basir, who is always watching. He is As-Sami, who is always hearing and is hearing all. He is Al-Alim, who is all-knowing. He is full aware of what we feel. And so he is also Al-Hakim, the most wise. There is always a wisdom behind every difficulty he sends. Every, he, every difficulty he sends to his servants, there's always a wisdom. It's said such times we need to do what? We need to remember Allah, be grateful for the blessings he, he has still carried on with. 
and we keep on praying for the betterment of the hardships. We just need to, we need to keep on remembering Allah, to be grateful to Allah, to rely on Allah, to be happy and stay content with the orders of Allah and to pray for Allah and to have trust in Allah. Through these, all these instances, Surah Kahaf instructs all of us to overcome the love of this world and handle one's trials and worries through reliance. Another thing which I would want to explain was, um, I did not do it previously, is who was Hazrat Khazar? Some believe that he was a prophet, other things that they say that he was a saint and mostly reported in commentaries is that he was an angel because neither prophets nor saints, they are not permitted to harm Allah's servant. Whereas Hazrat Khizr was seen doing so. So it can be assumed that he was an angel and he is known as Khizr because he was wearing a green turban and Khadara, Khadara is the Arabic name for green color. Verse number 83, and they ask you about Zulqarnain, say, I will recite to you about him a report. Now, the third question, which the people of Mecca asked Prophet ﷺ was, who was Zil Qarnain? Zil Qarnain, the means the one with, and Qaran. Qaran means three things, lock of hair, edges, people, or time. So it means Zil Qarnain means what? A person with two horns, a person having two locks of hair, a person walking to two edges of the world or a person living in two eras or two times of people. It is said that he either had two swellings on his head or he wore a two-horned cap and that is why he was called Zulkarnan. Or he would have two locks of hair dangling down his forehead or on his shoulders or that he conquered two edges of the world from east to the west. And that is why he was called Zulkarnan. Or that he lived into his kingdom and his victorious period of glory lasted for two eras of, human, of humanity. And that is why he was called as Zulkarnan. Indeed, we established him upon the earth and we gave him to everything away. So he followed away. He was a blessed person. He was young, youthful, strong, good looking. He was victorious. He had authority. He had power. He had rule. And then he had riches. He had wealth. He had skill. He had know-how. He had knowledge. He, had, he was a very blessed person. But receiving all these blessings and bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not turn arrogant or proud. He was not cruel and he was not tyrannical. He was not self-centered, conceited or arrogant. And he, in all these luxuries, did not fail to remember Allah. He was continuously remembering Allah. He was obedient to Allah. And he was what? He was using all these blessings, not for just himself or not for gaining more wealth, but he used and he spent all these blessings and bounties of Allah for the path of Allah, for the spreading of the teachings of the messages of Allah, and for the implementations of the commandments of Allah on the land of Allah. So this was his gratitude, which we need to understand as far as the importance of life of hereafter, all these being blessed by all these things in the life of this world, he was using all these for what? for trading and for bartering for the life of hereafter. So he followed away, verse number 86, until he reached the setting of the sun. He found it as if 
sitting in a spring of dark mud, and he found near it people, Allah said, O Dhul Karnayn, either you punish them or else adopt um, among them a way of goodness. He said, as for one who has wrongs, we will punish them. Then he will be returned to his Lord and he will punish him with a terrible punishment. But as for one who believes and does righteousness, he will have a reward of paradise and we will speak to him from our command with ease. So, Zilkarnan, uh, he uh, was what? He uh, traveled towards the West and he conquered the people. And um, in fact, he conquered the people and uh, having conquered them, he did not sit back and did not relax, journeyed around the land to eradicate evil within the society and bring peace and equilibrium and spread deen and the way of Allah. And Zulkarnan's conquest were not carried out for the sake of expanding his reign, but for the sake of spreading Islam and righteousness and to eradicate unjustness. So this was all what he was using his blessings and bounties for. And then he did not, after conquering this area, he did not stay here and start enjoying his victory and his blessings, but then he followed away until he came to the rising of the sun. This is what first he went toward, uh, he went toward the west and now he's going towards the east. When he, come to the, he came to the rising of the sun, he found it rising on a people for whom he had not made against it any shield. Thus, and we had encompassed all that we had in knowledge and then he followed away. So from here, he did what? After maintaining peace in this land, he campaigned towards uh, and on, uh, he campaigned and he conquered the East. And the people of this land were like what? They were underdeveloped and they were underprivileged. And um, Zulkarnan had the opportunity to be cruel to them and to exploit them even more. But he feared Allah because he knew that he would be accountable, accountable for his actions and um, treated all them as his dependent. And he chose to be a righteous king and he chose to help all the people of Allah by all what he had. Verse 93, until when he reached a pass between two mountains, and uh, in most of the commentaries, we learn that this is what this was his uh, travel or his campaign towards the north. He found bes uh, besides them a people who could hardly understand his speech. They were what? They were like illiterate people. Verse number 94, they said, O Dilkarnain, indeed, Yajuj and Majuj are great corruptors in the land. So may we assign for you an expenditure that you may make between us and them a barrier. He said, that in which my Lord has established me is better than what you offer. No lust, no desire, no desire to possess more. So he was content with what he had. He did not want more. But assist me with strength. I will make you, I will make between you and them a, a dam. So he asked for what? He asked for manpower. Bring me sheets of iron, using all the skill, using all the knowledge he had to serve Allah's people. Bring me the sheets of iron until when he had leveled them up between the two mountainous walls, he said, blow with bellows until when he uh, until when he had made it like fire, he said, bring me that I may pour over it molten copper. So Yajuj and Majuj were unable to pass over it, nor were they able to effect it in any penetration. Zulkarnan said, this is a mercy from my Lord. Remember, he is grateful and he is not boasting for all the skills, for all the knowledge, for all the know-how he has. And he is not turning arrogant. He is just saying what? He's staying grateful to Allah and and he is not trying to show off his own skills, but he's just trying to introduce Allah. This is a mercy from my Lord. But when the promise of my Lord comes, he will make it leveled. And ever is the promise of my Lord true. And we will leave them that day surging over each other. Who? Yajuj and Majud. And then the horn will be blown and we will assemble them in one assembly and we will present held that day to the disbelievers on display. So here we learn 
from all these verses that Zilkarnain then he journeyed to the north till he reached people who were so illiterate that they spoke an unknown language and the society of these people they were being uh, they were being distracted uh, by the corruption of yajuj and majuj so they requested him to help him build a wall or a dam and he did not hesitate in spending his time and energy and skill and resources and wealth in order to help the people. This is actually a trial. And this is actually how we need to behave when we are being tried by blessings of Allah. Zulkarnain's action teaches us how to spend in the way that is beloved by Allah. Allah bestowed him with innumerable blessings like wealth, knowledge, skill, power, but knew that all these blessings were what? They were trusts from Allah and they were gifts from Allah, which he will be accountable for. So instead of falling prey to arrogance, conceit, self-centeredness, and indulging in luxuries, and assuming that his riches were the result of his own hard work, he would always be by their side. He dedicated his life and his blessings to spend in the service of the bondsmen of Allah. So this is what we learn. And then here in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned about Yajuj and Majuj. They were uh, creating havoc on the land and the people wanted to be relieved of all what they were doing. And uh, Zulkarnan helped them build the wall and the wall was erected, but there he informed them. Um, I would also want to mention that there are people who say that this wall, which was erected by Zilkarnan, was a great wall of China, but there's no information whatsoever about the location of the wall in Quran and Hadith. And uh, authentic Hadith, they do mention that Yajuj and Majuj, they are locked behind this wall, and they will be successful in breaking through the wall before the Day of Judgment. And we know from Prophet Sallallahu narration that Yajuj and Majuj will escape from behind the wall um, um, by the time Hazrat Isa salam, would have descended also. Uh, I will be talking about this in detail when I will be talking about the signs of resurrection. And uh, these Yajuj and Majuj have been detailed explanation in Hadith that they have, um, they will be uh, people who will be yellow hued and they will be short and stocky people with small eyes and broad leathery faces. And they will come running and descending from heights and they will drink all the water and finish all the food from wherever they will pass. And they will shoot fire laden arrows towards the sky, most probably like missiles or rockets or whatever they were. and today and uh, they will um, they will return these uh, these fire laden arrows they will return towards them all bloody and they would assume that they have killed all the dwellers in the sky also and their tyranny will grow so much that as atisa al-islam and his followers they will be forced to exile to the mountains and life in exile will eventually become difficult for the Muslims. And then Hazrat Isa alayhi salam will pray to Allah to rid the creatures from the earth. And then by the order of Allah, Yajuj and Majuj, they will all die and their bodies will rot and they will putrefy the environment. And then by the pray and supplication of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, there will be a heavy downpour of rain which will wash all the corpses and clean the order from all the environment of the earth. So this is what we learn about Yajuj and Majuj as the signs of uh, resurrection before the day of resurrection. Those whose eyes had been within a cover removed from my remembrance and they were not able to hear, then, th then do those who disbelieve think that they can take my servants instead of me as allies? Indeed, we have prepared hell for the disbelievers as a lodging. Allahumma ajirna min nar. Say, shall we believe? Shall we believers inform you of the greatest losers as to their deeds? They are those whose effort is lost in the worldly life while they think that they are doing well. 
in work. Those are the ones who disbelieve in the verses of their Lord and in their meeting of him. So their deeds have been worthless and we will not assign to them on the day of resurrection any importance. That is their recompense, hell, for what they denied. And because they took my signs and my messengers in ridicule, indeed those who have not believed and done righteous deeds, they will have the gardens of paradise as a lodging wherein they abide eternally. They will not desire from it any transfer. Verse 109, say, if the sea were ink for the writing, for writing the words of my Lord, the sea would be exhausted before the words of my Lord were exhausted, even if we brought the like of it as a supplement. Words of my Lord means what? This means Allah's being, his attribute, his characteristics, his unlimited power, and all the blessings and miracles he sends down on all of us, trillions and trillions of books and pages will not be enough to write and explain the entity <coughs> that is Allah and his bounties to his creation. May Allah make our hearts indifferent, indifferent to the temptations of the world. And may our hearts be filled with the fear of hereafter, with the love of Allah, with the love of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Say, I am only a man like you to whom has been revealed that your God is one God. So whoever would hope for the meeting with his Lord, let him do righteous work and do not associate in worship of his Lord anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us set the correct priorities and preferences in our life. Fatir was sama wati wal earth, Antawali ye fit dunya wal akhira, Tavafani Muslim wa al hikani biswali. Amin summa mean.